about two more minutes to log in and uh, we expect to start on time in just a few minutes. Thank you. Hello everyone, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on where you might be in the world. I hope you are all well and safe and appreciate your taking the time to participate in this conference. I'd like to thank FIRA for hosting this event and for the invitation to participate. I'm your moderator for the next hour. My name is David Ferbata, and I'm editorial director for Meister Media Worldwide's Agribusiness Group it includes Crop Life, Agribusiness Global, and PrecisionAg.com. We have an exciting roundtable discussion planned today, exploring how the leading manufacturers of, of row crop machinery view autonomy and how new product introductions are creating an incremental pathway to broader farmer adoption of autonomous machines. How does autonomy translate into return on investment for farmers? What are the barriers to entry for fully autonomous planters, combines, and sprayers? What is the pace and timeline for new product introductions and farmer adoption? We'll answer these questions and more in the next hour. If you have questions for our panelists, you can use the Q&A chat feature on your display to submit them. We'll review and address just as many as possible during the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of this session. Our panelists today are Kent Brown, Senior Product Manager for Harvesting Automation for John Deere. Andrew Sunderman, Senior Manager of Global Farming Solutions for Agco Corporation. And Brett McClelland, he's Product Manager of Precision Agriculture for CNH Industrial, which owns Case IH. Gentlemen, uh, welcome and thank you for being here today. So, um, I'd like to start with uh, a couple questions for the entire panel, um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about what you do, what your responsibilities are, uh, a brief introduction to what you're working on these days, and maybe answer this first question, what's the most recent autonomous product introduction that you've commercialized? And uh, Brett, we can start with you. Yeah, fantastic. I appreciate the introduction and, and, and thank you for the invite to be here and speak in front of all of you today. It's, a, it's an honor for me. Um, definitely someone who's extremely passionate about robotics and automation. Uh, so to see a conference like this and see so much progress is, is, is really amazing. So thanks again for the, the opportunity here. Um, really, so my role at CNH, I'm a product manager covering um, really a portfolio of solutions focused on really ag tech, uh, precision ag, lots of different names for it, but it's basically a lot of the, the mainstream technologies today, as well as our more innovative um, future roadmap of technologies covering really automation and autonomous vehicles. So uh, pretty, pretty broad swath of areas, but really what, what my team does is we look across our, our customer segments, um, try and find, find value that we can capture through, through technology. And ultimately our goal is, is, is to use technology to make farmers more productive, um, more efficient, more successful. Um, so from a product management point of view, finding these, finding these nuggets, um, working with the technology teams to find the right ways to solve these problems, and then making sure we bring them to market in, in the most impactful way for our, our different growers around the world. So for me, that's, that's really the, the, the space I operate in. Um, in terms of really the latest product introduction, I think that's, that's a tough one to kind of like picking a favorite child, so to speak. Um, but there, there've been several. Uh, if you look across our, our portfolio, we have a couple different areas where we've innovated lately. Um, really the, the one that we're all quite proud of is our, our latest 
latest series of tractors that we've we've introduced. Um, you might know them in the market as the AFS Connect series, Magnum or Steigers, or the PLM Intelligence series, um, T8 and T9 tractors. Really, this is a culmination of a lot of work that's that's came from the back of you know, our autonomous concept tractor in, in 2016. And you're seeing us put into production some of that technology at, a, at an extremely broad scale. So new positioning technology, um, advanced guidance and, and end of row turn automation solutions. Um, that's, that's certainly, you know, one area which is um, top of mind when you talk about some of the latest ag tech solutions. Um, but also there's a there's there's other areas of just called gen more general automation, um, automation of harvesting systems or so harvest command solution, as well as automation of even some of our latest solutions for tillage and, and soil management, uh, we call soil command. So really, there's been a number of different fronts we've been providing what we, what we would call automation solutions on. Um, and depending on the level of automation, um, Solution varies, but I'll give just a couple of those out as examples and happy to talk through them in more detail later if the, the question comes back around. But I'd say, again, thank you for, for the opportunity. Looking forward to discussing this with, with Kent and Andrew. Um, and appreciate the moderation here, David. So I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you. Uh, Kent, why don't you go next? I'm just going uh, around my window here. <laughs> Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, David, and, and thanks again for the, the opportunity today. Excited to be on this, this well-qualified panel. Uh, my name is Kent Brown. I've been with John Deere for 16 years. My title is Senior Product Manager at Harvesting Automation. And really what that is, is a, a focus on, you know, ensuring the, the automation features we're bringing to market are, are customer facing and, and provide the value that we set out to, to provide to our customers. Uh, and, and along the way, then developing that strategic roadmap of for all harvest steps, of what, what our automation strategy is, you know, heavily founded on where can we provide value to the customer. Uh, that, that also that includes it's it's some jump right to combines when they hear harvest, but that's all all of the John Deere products that we provide in the harvest step, and that's sugarcane harvesters, wind rowers, uh, combines, of course, forage harvesters, and even into the the baling baling and mowing. Uh, probably, uh, you know, a few of the the most noteworthy uh, un releases we've had. As of recent, Sea and Spray was probably our, our most noteworthy. That's the first commercially available Sea and Spray product uh, from the factory. And that's utilizing uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence to identify weeds and, and reduce chemical uh, input costs to the customer of up to you know, 77 to 80%. So spot spraying right on the weed, not uh, broadcast spraying. So that's that's a big advancement in, in that space. There's, you know, there's a lot of a uh, lot of folks looking at that scene spray technology, and we're we're excited to, to bring that one to market. Another big one, you know, when we get in the the guidance and, and navigation realm, we've had releases for decades now in the automation space, but our most recent is AutoPath, and that kind of gets into. I'm sure, we might even talk about it today, but the, you know, utilizing the digital ecosystem to to share those. Those, uh, those features across the production system. So, you know, using your planting lines at, at harvest and so on. So a couple of exciting ones there that uh, we're pretty excited about, our customers are excited about. And uh, again, thanks for the opportunity today. Looking forward to a great discussion. Great, thank you. Thank you. And Andrew. And Andrew. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, and David, thanks again for, for moderating what I think will be a, a great next hour or so. Um, just to, to get started, um, my name is Andrew Sunderman. I, I sit here in our Duluth-based office just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And my title is uh, Senior Manager of Global Farming Solutions. And I, as part of that role, I sit within our global product management team. And together with, uh, within our team, what we're really working to do is immerse ourselves in the businesses of our customers. So you, our customers, we're really trying to understand uh, what goes on in your operations, the things you must face, the things you need to consider, and really the challenges you face 
and where you might be underserved with the products and services that you have available to you. So our team then works together with our, our engineering teams to really identify those solutions and technologies that, that we can develop and bring to market for you, really providing a, a value, a measurable return to your operation. So that's a large team of us, but uh, with my specific area, I'm focused on anything related to uh, automation of that crop process, anything related towards autonomy, and also uh, kind of leveraging that autonomy piece, anything that leverages robotics as a potential solution for uh, solving the problems in, in agriculture around the world. As we talk about some of the uh, latest products around automation and autonomy that we've brought to market, I'll maybe, I'll maybe stick to two of them for the sake of time here. Um, the first one I'll highlight is our Autodoc, Autodoc excuse me, solution for our ideal combine. And this is a uh, system that now completely automizes the uh, connection process to the header and really takes it down from a multi-minute process to a couple of seconds process. So not just providing a, a, an automation in a field, but also providing a completely different way for user experience and really bringing a, a ease of use and time savings to an operation that before has been kind of a, a cumbersome process. The other one that I'll speak to is uh, something called TI Headland. And this is a system that really creates a completely driverless uh, experience in the field. Not only now are we driving way lines or driving pre-planned paths in the field, but now we're able to completely uh, automate that headland turning process, preparing the implement to be for the headland and getting it back into the row, and also completely making that turn, lining us up perfectly for that next pass. This, while the operator's still in the seat, has brought a essentially completely autonomous operating into the field environment where we're able to now drive that machine in the right place at the right time uh, to make sure that we do the task at hand perfectly each and every time. So with that, I'll, I'll maybe stop there for the sake of time and, and David, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, another question I think for, for the panel um, is, what does your corporate strategy look like when you're developing these new functions and features? A couple of the things you talked about um, have some driverless components to it. When we think about full autonomy, we think about a machine um, independently moving without a driver. But some of these are, are functions and features that farmers need to do um, that you've incorporated into new systems. So um, maybe we'll start with Brett again and talk about what does is, what is your strategic vision look like when you get in the boardroom, when you're talking about autonomy, where does that direction come from? Um, a combination between looking at the technology and listening to the customer. Yeah, I think, I mean, for us, it starts with the customer value. I think the way Andrew described that process is, is great. Um, I mean, you have to understand the customer's business, understand what drives them and understand how, you know, your company is uniquely positioned to solve problems. Um, really, we're a productivity driven company. We have been for over 100 years. It's just the way that you deliver productivity improvements is has changed um, for delivering productivity with technology now. Um, a lot of people see us as, you know, iron company or, or whatever, you know, you make bigger equipment and that is a way to, to improve productivity, but really our customers come to us for productivity solutions to make them more efficient, to get more work done, to do the work better. And you can do that, you know, bigger. You can do that by making them faster. You can do that by making the equipment smarter. Um, so a lot of these solutions we're looking at right now are in the realm of making, making things smarter, um, delivering efficiency in, in, in really that new way. So really strategically, we're looking for significant game changers in terms of productivity. Um, how can we take, take the, the product and services we provide the customer and leverage those to, to make their business more, more effective or more productive? And really, Autonomy, the vision of autonomy and fully autonomous operation is, 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 a, is, a, is a game changer potentially. I mean, if you look at the types of, of improvement you could get, you know, even if you just constrain the idea to let's say, you know, we're going to operate another hour or two, you know, three hours per night. So you take your average two shift farm and we add another hour, two hours, three hours, even in a very, I would say, constrained view of autonomy. 
it's a significant amount of productivity that can be delivered. So really on the one hand, we're looking for significant value drivers and productivity drivers and, and autonomy, autonomous operation is that. But on the other hand, you have to be you know, pragmatic and kind of, kind of work your way towards it. So we're also thinking very incrementally um, so that we can deliver value along that, along that trajectory. So a lot of the solutions I mentioned earlier, those are stepping stones um, towards a, a future innovation. Um, so we're really looking at it through two, two or, or more lenses. What, what's a, what, what is the path to, you know, kind of headline major productivity improvements? And then along the way, how can we help the farmers with uh, more modest steps, um, but the ones that are still impactful, either in productivity, ease of use, um, you know, efficiency. There, there's all of these benefits that, that come along the way. So I, I'd say strategically, we're looking to incrementally deliver productivity, you know, towards this, this broader end goal um, where we can be fully autonomous and really, really unlock, unlock a significant, you know, piece of value for the customer. So I would say strategically, I, I mean, that's, that's what drives us. That's what moves the business. And I think that's what farmers expect from us. So that's ultimately kind of, kind of how we think about it in, in the boardroom as, as you put it, David. Kent, what does it sound like at Deer? Yeah, a similar start to that story, just in the sense that it, everything is founded upon the customer value, you know, the economic opportunity that we can unlock for the customer. Um, but from, you know, when you start to bring in the business side of it, a lot of the, the talk around this tech space is adoption and utilization. Well, if, if you're founded in that value, uh, the, the adoption and utilization kind of take care of themselves. Um, as we look at, you know, strategically, I'll put a little bit different spin on the question and, and, and say that our focus is not a autonomy, it's, it's automation, automation leading to autonomy. And that's where, that's where you, you drive the divide maybe in the challenges we're trying to solve in the ag space uh, really collectively. And, and that's, there's one job in, in, drive, in, in the automotive industry, it's driving per se, per se right? Well, driving is one of our, our jobs, but if you look at a combine, it's 18,000 parts going down the field, uh, collecting 7,000 bushels an hour, um, you know, collecting, feeding, threshing, separating, throwing out the back, unloading on the go. And if you look at the jobs that you have to accomplish and, and the automation that it takes, if you were to ever get to full autonomy, that's the challenge, the, the challenge around the, you know, the the closed loop factory of a, of an 18,000 part machine. That's uh, trying to <laughs> try and it's shaking and going 10 miles per hour. And, and it's just a, a unique challenge that we face. And, and that's where we focus on the job quality and the, the automation of those jobs within that. Andrew. Yeah, I, th I think Kit brings up uh, quite the right point here. You know, we, we've, we've talked to, or you kind of mentioned, David, that uh, there is this talk of fully autonomous, and that means that the operator uh, is no longer in the cab. But the way we really kind of, a, of, a, of approach this is the fact that uh, in agriculture, we have a very unique problem than what many others face when they talk about autonomous vehicles. We must make sure that the job that is being done is not just being done safely, like uh, we might consider with unmanned driving, but that the job is being done as well or better than what can be done when that operator is sitting in the cab. So the way we kind of preface that is we are an outcome-based company. We sell an outcome to a customer, whether that's uh, the, the seed being in the right spot, the seed being at the right depth, uh, maybe that's the, the most grain being delivered, delivered to the elevator, but that's the outcome that our customers are expecting. So we kind of take that approach. We start from the back, if you will, and we look at how do we make that outcome better than what it's being done today. And so that uh, may be more the formal term we use is that's the automation piece, uh, removing that uh, what today is an operator directed process, as I call it, and really making that now a decision that a machine can determine and can act upon based off of what it's actually encountering in the field. And so from there, we then take that and we say, OK, at some point we are going to be able to have enough automation of those human processes that that operator is going to be able to walk out of the cab at the point that they're ready for it. And that's the point where we come in and we want to make sure that we have a variety of uh, autonomous solutions that meet customers for their given desire, 
their level of uh, need for the solution and also uh, their application. And from there, we want to focus on not just providing autonomy in one given aspect of their operation, but how do we connect each one of these phases of the crop cycle that we can deliver these same customer benefits, value adding features to the process that they're doing, to the operation and throughout the entire operation as a whole is how we discuss our path to autonomy. That's great. So um, this, that's a good um, segue into talking a little bit about grower adoption and um, what tools they need to become more comfortable with the technology. Um, we'll stick with you, uh, Andrew, for, for the first chance to answer this one. Um, when, when you're looking at um, you know, adoption, we, we see what happened with auto steer, right? Auto steer was introduced. It was, you know, there were early adopters. It was very slow to take hold to get that incremental purchase price up to have that technology until it became standardized. And then it came in um, and, and its use rate skyrocketed. So what is standard now on these machines? What is still optional? And, and how do you see the modern adoption trends going for some of these new technologies? Yeah, it's a, a great question. So I'll maybe start with what is what is standard. Um, really, the way we look at what's standard on a machine is anything that connects the various aspects of the crop cycle and is used to connect the various enterprises of that operation. So that would be technologies such as guidance systems. Many of our uh, larger you know, professional producer machines uh, are now being offered in, in one variant with a standard guidance system uh, to the customer. We also talk about data management tools. So uh, things like our TASDOC system, which allows us to wirelessly transfer data to and off of machines that connects the entire enterprise. And then lastly, also looking at the connectivity piece, critical, critical area uh, for that farming enterprise. And that's something that is now standard on our machines because we wanna make sure that we can give that full view, full fleet view of what's going on in the operation to our customers. So those are the areas really connecting the enterprise that we know need to be standard on each one of these machines, but that's also come as customers have been demanding that. As we look at features that are at are more optional, um, those are really getting into the application specific features. Things that we would be required for, for one farming type versus another, or one sort of implement type over another as well. Those are things that we still maintain uh, as options where a customer can really customize that machine to their task and their operation. But I think what's important about that is giving a customer the ability to purchase or to uh, upgrade to that given technology throughout their life cycle of, the, of their ownership with the product. And so that way, as, as we grow in our technology, as they grow in their enterprise, even though the machine is still the same, they can add these value adding technologies to meet their ever-changing practices and the growing needs that they have, have on their farm. Um, as we do look at the future, to, to speak to the third part of the question, I think where we will see the clear adoption is those features that provide a clear monetary benefit or ease of use benefit to our customers. Things that directly relate to the bottom line, to increasing a net farm, customer's net farm income, those are features that we already see today having the quickest adoption and I think that will only continue as we move forward. We're really starting to see more of a focus on not just some of the uh, traditional features of a machine, what's the horsepower, what's the tire size, things like that, but what are the things that enhance, again, the outcome that I'm looking for that machine or implement or tool to do? What are those things that do this, provide this outcome better than uh, what's been done before to increase my yield and to reduce my waste? Those are the features I think we'll continue to see having that highest adoption and ultimately customers saying, I'm not considering a machine without them. Great. Brett, you talked a little bit about AccuTurn, um, Harvest Command. Those are relatively recent introductions to the portfolio. Um, tell us a little bit about what the adoption looks like on those and, and um, what, what is you know, kind of the bleeding edge feature that becomes standard on, on your machines? Yeah, I, I would say our really standard feature set is is a is a reflection of of demand in in a, in a lot of ways. When we when we launch a feature and similar to what Andrew mentioned, um, if monetary value is there, if it's clear to the customer what the benefit is, the 
the demand and, and standardization follows very quickly. Um, the harvest command system, the, the take rates, the, the amount of customers, you know, asking for that, that product is significantly higher than we even forecasted. So that one has been extremely well received, extremely positive. Um, the automated turning solution, um, we've had that solution for a number of years, but have launched introductions or a new introduction, higher performing system. So also extremely positive take rate there. Um, both of those are, are still incremental options um, because you know, we try and give as much flexibility as possible. On a, on a lot of our, our larger machines, they all come standard with the capability. And then we can, we can offer the, the, the upsell or, or with a simple, simple activation, um, the option for the customer to take that. Now, depending on the product and the market, a lot of times those eventually do become standard. Um, but that's really a decision that's that's driven by the region, the product, um, and ultimately the popularity of the, the solution itself. So we kind of see that as a natural evolution where as we introduce products, um, they become standard based on on their own their own success. So at this point in time, you know, a lot of our classic options, you know, guidance, section control connectivity, um, even our, a lot of our cloud features um, with AFS Connect now, they're all offered as, as factory standard permanently or for a significant number of years with new technology, with, with a new product purchase. And then some of the newer features um, are still standard availability, uh, but you can buy them kind of a la carte as an upgrade. So we kind of give, give the customers options, but as they, as they show interest and as that interest grows it becomes you know kind of rolled back into that standard package so i think it's a it's a similar trajectory um for for most of us um but like you said there, there's 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 a lot that's now you know years later into that standard package but we're continuing to innovate offer new new options functions which we have this conference again in a couple of years um they might be standard <laughs> And how about a deer? What, uh, how, do you, how do you look at um, what, what comes standard on machines and, and what still um, is you're, you're asking the buyer to purchase or add on or you know, might, might limit some of that product introduction for the, for the, the larger audiences? Yeah, I think one of the important things here is you have to be comfortable with, with the standardization of these things being natural. And you know, when you, when you look at what Deere had done two dec a couple decades ago with the introduction of AutoTrack and kind of revolutionizing that space, there, there's really no reason to rush a standardization. But as you start to mix in safety features, we've seen this in the automotive industry where um, once, once you get into those safety standards, it probably be, becomes a quicker pace. We see that with blind spot detection, adaptive cruise control, where they almost become expected, and 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 but once you get into the 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 leading edge space, I think the other point I want to make in this on this topic is we should be very comfortable um, that this these could be low take rate to start uh, feature and tech and tech stacks. When we look at you know cutting edge technology, we shouldn't expect. Uh, to have 100% of, of the customer base to, to adopt those, um, especially when you're pushing the limits. Now in these, you know, in the guidance space, that's become a pretty industry standard uh, space. So, you know, incremental improvements upon auto steer, auto track, um, those are already standardized in the industry. So I, I think it's a naturally occurring thing uh, for Deer. We, you know, we, we try and position it to where it's uh, best, um, most easily acquisition by our customer. And when you serve a global customer base, I think that's the other important thing to keep in mind is, you know, you, you can't standardize things too fast. Otherwise you're, you're negatively impacting that, that more cost conscious customer and the non-leading adopter in, in, a, in a different region. So, so Kent, I'll say with you, um, you all seem to be saying that um, farmer adoption might be slowing some of the introduction standardization more so than the technology. Is, is that fair? Is, 
is demand lagging um, what we're able to deliver? I, I, you said me first, right, David? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, I would say no. I mean, we're, we're exploring every single automation opportunity out there that, that adds value to the customer. Maybe um, how quickly we introduce those to market is impacted by, by how willing our customers are to accept it. But if you look at, you know, I'm, I, I've, I've worked with farmers globally. I'm not sure though on the, the global per perception of farmers, but um, sometimes sometimes it's uh, they're w way understated. And what I mean by that is farmers are brilliant. Farmers are tech savvy. Farmers want this. They're hungry for this technology. It's a very competitive market. And um, so I, I would not say that they're slowing um, our development or the adoption. It's just, it's got to provide value. Um, farmers are counting pennies per se. Um, you know, the, the margins the margins can vary greatly. Um, sure, they'll have a couple of good years, but they have a lot of years where they're micromanaging every cent. And so they just, ha they just want to make sure that that automation feature can bring them value. Andrew, what do you think about it? Um, that that point about the technology leading the market or the market kind of pulling through that technology introduction. Yeah, I, I think it's one where uh, certainly customers are, are ready for many different levels of technology. Um, so I would not say that any of our developments are being slowed down by the demand for it. But what I do think is, is matching um, what can be done today with what we plan for the future. And what I mean by that is still many of these, uh, whether it's automation or, or full autonomy, it's a very costly technology. It comes at a very high, high cost as compared to the solution that's being used today in the farming operation. And so that's where we need to really pinpoint those developments and in, in working with our customers to find those main uh, challenges and those main areas where that keeps them up at night and solve those problems first, because those are the ones where um, some of the, the cost of this very, advanced technology will provide a measurable benefit to them. So by no means do I think customers are slowing that down. I think the demand is coming from customers, but it will also take us uh, putting technology into the, those markets to provide for those customers that are ready today, building the capabilities for that uh, growing customer base to reach a, a wider range of applications and also uh, meet customers where they are at with the challenges and, and frustrations in their operation. So Brad, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, evolve the question a little bit for you. You know, um, we're talking about cost. Our, we're, what we're really talking about is ROI here. So what is the next step to um, creating that value? Um, in what area of the farming operation makes sense to innovate at this point? Or, or maybe that technology is already there and it's being um, realized by large producers. No, I mean, so I think there's lots of areas to innovate. I mean, there's really the, I would say the, the problem isn't, you know, which area to innovate, it's, it's where to apply your focus. Um, I think there's probably a couple key technology areas if we're really going to truly walk that path towards autonomous operation. And really, you see a lot of innovation in, in, in really the remote monitoring capabilities, kind of the evolution of you know, for us, it's our AFS Connect, PLM Connect solutions, where you can remotely monitor not only where your fleet is, the health of the machine, you can also monitor the quality of the work um, by mapping implement data and other performance data. So really one, one big area to innovate is, is helping customers be comfortable that things are going well when they're not in the cab, especially for large operations give them the ability to know confidently that the work that's being done, the job that's being done is done right. Um, even if they're not there to personally see it. So there's a huge amount of innovation in, in, you know, recording, you know, interesting data on the machine, but then also showing it in the cloud um, to the customers, you know, giving the customer the connection with via a mobile app or some sort of application to, to see in real time what the machine's doing. So that's, that's really one whole evolution path. Um, 
there's definitely evolution happening right in front of our eyes, you know, from the guidance systems, you know, even though, even though they've been around for a while, I think there's, there's definitely still room there. I know Kent mentioned, you know, John Deere's Autopath. Um, we have similar, you know, features, we, different names, but um, we, we definitely see making the, the guidance system easier to use, but also more cohesively planning, um, you know, where the machines go, how they coordinate with one another, and basically coordinating, you know, multiple machines together. Uh, we launched a product called AccuSync here recently, um, which allows machines to share their guidance lines with one another um, so that you can do more than just one-to-one -one machine guidance. You can collaborate as a fleet. Um, so really in each one of these areas, I think there's plenty of, of, of room to innovate and also evolve towards that, that end goal, um, really the pinnacle, which, which I see is autonomous operation. So, so each of those, I think there's, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fruit to, to bear, um, but really in each one of those spheres, I mean, I could go on for days about this, so I don't mean to take too much time, but yeah, I think each one of those segments, there's, there's lots of, of room to innovate and then provide those, those new value streams to customers. Okay, great. Kent, um, there's been a lot of talk um, about crop protection kind of being that next area where autonomous functionality is really going to um, take hold rather rapidly. Of course, it's driven by sustainability initiatives and, and food safety and land management. Um, you recently, and this coincides with uh, one of our one of our audience questions too. You recently um, commercialized Select Spray, which is a fallow weed control. Um, this is a green on brown recognition system. It's not quite getting to that um, that Blue River uh, green on green recognition system. Can you can you just talk a little bit about the differences between those two platforms? And, and what you see in terms of the future of, of crop uh, protection or um, spray uh, autonomy. Um. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're uh, going outside of my wheelhouse on the harvesting automation side, but I like the challenge. So <clears throat> I, I spent some time in crop care, so comfortable answering. So yeah, it, you know, the important thing when you, when you mentioned the two different platforms, it, it's really, not in the sense that Blue River is John Deere, John Deere is Blue River. And what you see in the John Deere Sea and Spray Select first initial offering on, on fallow ground, that is a uh, Blue River co-developed uh, product. You know, the collaboration with John Deere and productionizing that and, and offering it through the factory. That is, that is what you knew of Blue River before the acquisition and, and that's what we developed together. So, you know, also from what you saw from Blue River pre-acquisition, um, you know, you have to, you have to imagine the natural progression then is, is the next step in, you know, going beyond fallow ground and, and just being able to identify the weed at all times. And you saw that from Blue River uh, before, before deer uh, was in the picture. So that, that natural progression uh, is absolutely going to continue. Uh, we're, more than uh, uh, ecstatic about the the Blue River team that we have. It's it's a it's a competency and talent pool that uh, just just enhances uh, what we already have with our intelligent solutions group. So that's that's pretty exciting. Like you said, you know, sustainability is a driving force. That um, how nice is it that you know reducing input costs by eighty percent also uh, re reduces chemical uh, on the ground by eighty percent. So that's that's a very uh, nice pairing there, and just looking at the broader question that you know Brett was was answering, you know it's there's kind of three areas in the bottom line of a of a customer's ROI, and it's it's the input, it's it's how can they impact the yield, and then it's how how much how well can they harvest it, basically their paycheck, right? And so as we look at that, um, I, I think you there. Brett kind of mentioned it, but you can't just focus in one area. There's just there's just too many opportunities in the complicated task of farming um, to, to not look at automation. And then really importantly, and we haven't talked a lot about this, but is that kind of digital ecosystem 
that's a that's a that's a tougher one to think about um, it, because then we we play in a space where there's a lot of other other uh, industry parity not in agriculture but this digital ecosystem enabling farmers to have all the data they want make the analytic analytical decisions on next year's uh, production cycle to save them money again so this this data piece of empowering our customers to make really good decisions is a really important piece. When do you think global rate crop protection will be more widespread? Variable rate crop protection. I mean, that's or, been or the select the the select spray technology. I'm, I'm using yeah. that broad term. Perhaps it's inaccurate. Yeah. No. No. No worries. Uh, you know, this one has been. I, I'm trying to think. Uh, I wasn't at every Agrotechnica, but I for sure was at 2017 and 2019. And those tend to be kind of leading edge on the, you know, what what industry is willing to show that they're working on. And and sea and spray has been shown for five or six years plus now, right? And so the the progression has ramped up. And so sooner than later. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, a driving force um, by deer and it's a driving force that others in the industry are working on. I'd like to remember, uh, remind the audience that you can ask questions of our panel in the Q&A chat feature. Uh, we'll carry on with the panel discussion for just about 10 more minutes and we'll start to address some of those questions. Um, so please do interact with this great panel. Um, Brett, when, um, there, there is a question up here. We'll just kind of pick at these because they are falling into our stream of consciousness here. But uh, a question about that you started to answer about the difference between autonomy when it comes to drivers and, uh, and automation. And um, perhaps you have an example in which uh, you can give us that talks about some, you know, all of the different functions that go into um automation versus having someone there to make sure the automation is working correctly yeah absolutely so i mean i i have quite a bit of history in this this space of definitions too because i mean personally i think it's crucial because you know i've been in this space of automation autonomy for quite a while now and, and you can you can waste a lot of time talking at each other if you don't really know what solution you're talking about um, so having a clear definition of levels like the automotive industry has for, say, level one, level two, level three, level four is, is huge. Um, and a number of years ago, we launched uh, from the CNH perspective what we view the level one, two, three, four, five concepts to be. Um, and you can Google that, if, like Case IH levels of automation or something, and, and you'll see our, our perspective on it. But it's super important because when you talk you know, to some people, you know, they, they, they start talking about, you know, steering and, and turning and, and stuff that, you know, deer and case IH and ADCO we've had for, you know, a decade. So that's not autonomy in farming. That's, that's definitely automation. It's a meaningful step where what we talk about more than the automotive industry is really the, the end goal, which is let's, let's get the work done and, and unchain the operator from the tractor cap. Let's redeploy that farmer to go do other value add work. Um, so we talk a lot more about level four and level five when we say autonomy, um, or at least personally I do. With level one and lo level one, two, and three really being flavors of automation. Um, really there's, there's someone in the cab, you know, doing various parts of the job. So really, I like to use those levels to really just set the stage because the different solutions, you know, fall within them. In the driver assistance kind of categories, level one, that's where a lot of our technologies have been for, for a while now evolving. Um, as we get into the, the level two and level three, we get into more of the highly automated solutions. That's where you'll see quite a bit of innovation, I believe, in the next, you know, coming years, you know, working up to that full embodiment of, of level four. When you say autonomy, like to a farmer, um, a lot of them envision like, you know, the full autonomous thing driving down the road, which is not necessarily what we're talking about in a lot of cases. 
So I think it's critical just as a first step, just getting on the same page with, with definitions. So you can, you can really focus in on the, the solution space you're discussing because the value propositions for the customer are quite different. Um, the technology is quite different. Um, the time frame is quite different, so on and so forth. So I'm a big fan of definitions. I was about to type in the chat um, that, so I'm glad you asked the, the question, but that's just a little bit of insight into how my brain works when it comes to these definition questions. Andrew, is your definition of, of that dynamic relatively similar? Um, how, how do you guys talk about the, the differentiation between automation and autonomy? Yeah, I think it runs in a similar realm, but I'll add a few maybe points to that. Uh, I think as, as certainly as we talk about automation, um, what, it, what we can look at is taking those things that are done today by an operator and having them be a decision or action based off the machine. That, that essentially is the automation piece. Um, the autonomy piece, certainly something maybe more the, uh, the, the, the mountaintop, it's the, the bright and shiny thing in some cases, but that's when we actually now uh, are able to do that A to B driving without an operator sitting directly in the cab. And I think uh, for most customers, certainly there are some customers that have certain challenges that are, that are so drastic in their operation that the simple driving of A to B safely is something that they're willing and ready to adopt in their farm. For most customers, that driverless operation is not even a factor in their head until we can prove that the outcome can, that they want can be achieved while they are still sitting on that machine without input from their side. So I think that's the piece where automation naturally uh, has to come first and is going to grow. You've seen us as, as companies, all three of our companies on the panel here today, but each one of our companies introducing products every year, uh, if not even more often than that, that slowly and, and, and even in some cases very quickly, take a lot of those processes that an operator does today and make that a central part of the machine. And we're, you know, from an agro side, we're gonna continue to do that uh, so that at one point, a customer, when they are satisfied with the outcome, with their needs are being met, they're going to be able to uh, transition that who was an in-cab operator to other value adding tasks that they have in their operation. Okay, great. Um, so Andrew, let's stay with you for a second, um, and, and we're going to start to address some of these um, audience questions. Thank you very much for those who are, are uh, addressing some questions and interacting with us. Um, this is why we're here, so we appreciate that. Um, and, and let's talk about some of the data that is going into how you're collecting and, and address a difficult topic that, um, you know, I think all of your companies have um, have been addressing, or um, there's been maybe some, um, uh, there've been higher expectations for um, some of these technologies to work in tandem together um, a little bit more. So how are you addressing the usage of all the data you're collecting to then help the farmer? And are these systems becoming any more interoperable Good, good question. So um, I'll maybe start with our strategy around data. And, and, and our strategy around data is that the customer owns the data. And um, that's something we've been very transparent about from day one, I would say, that the, the customers own their data. What we are doing is one working to collect that data, present it in an easy way for them to view and, and analyze the data, and also drive decisions based off the data. Simply collecting the data is, is nice. But where it becomes a value to a customer is when we can uh, recommend actions or they can decide actions specifically based off of that data. Um, you certainly talk about uh, lots of different data is coming from and how do we connect all those pieces. So we have uh, engaged with a number of different partners to be able to connect and distribute that data to different areas. Um, things like uh, the agri router are, are different options that we provide to customers where that, that data can be sent off the machine, uh, off of their implements, and they can decide where and who it needs to go to so that they can begin to connect that enterprise of their farm. So that's something that uh, we're, I would say, we're at a level now that we can provide the benefit to customers and it's only gonna be something that continues to iterate and become more usable, really focused on those decision-making things that the data can drive for customers. Kent, what is, um... What does it look like at Deere when you're discussing interoperability, interoperability and easy for me to say, 
And, um, and what platforms are you using to make data available at the decision-making process at the farm gate? Yeah, in similar start to, to how Andrew said, you know, no questions asked. Most important point is the customers own the data and they own the permissions to that data. Uh, and, the, and the tool that we use uh, that John Deere has been offering now for, uh, we had a, a similar tool in the past, uh, more recently we've, re we've released Operation Center, which we, um, which we allow our customers to have for free. And that's, a, that's the analysis tool, that's the sharing tool. So with those permissions that are totally up to the customer on how the, that data is shared, that operation center is the is the tool, the, the gateway to communication with the dealer, communication to uh, their agronomist, communication to the farm manager and, and their employees um, and co-ops who are doing uh, third party services, whether it's spraying or nutrient application. So it's it's combining that aggregate data and, and allowing the, the customer to define who gets to see it. Um, and once once you get it, that in there, you get things like this field analyzer uh, within Operations Center, where you know you're looking at application rates uh, versus from last year versus application rates of the year before, and your two uh, wheat varieties that you used, and and looking at those differences. So it's it's kind of unlocking that complete. Uh, data set for our customers to make those. I think I mentioned it in our last question, just those analytical decisions. Um, but you're right; it's uh, data is a, a sensitive topic, and uh, but I think we uh, we approach it very transparently. We we actually just just to get a quick plug in because it it's a very good overview of how Deer approaches data. But um, Deer.com forward slash uh, trust is is where you can kind of get more insight into Deer's policy on on data. Ken, let's stay with you. Um, and I'm going to combine a couple of these questions um, and, and talk about perhaps some smaller farmers. You know, what options are there with for machines, for autonomous machines for um, maybe a smaller farmer community? And, you know, are, are these large automated machines going to be so economical um, you know, in the long term that that smaller farmers might not have a chance to compete in this market. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's a great question. You know, at, at some point you have to have the right machine for the size of your operation. And so, you know, how we try and cover that is with a, a broad portfolio. And, and I mentioned earlier, you know, serving globally, right? We have to accommodate different farming practices from Brazil to North America, to Europe, to uh, Ukraine or Russia. And so within that gives us, you know, a, a nice broad portfolio for that range of machine size, but then specifically to automation, right? That's the topic of the day. We, we try and this is where it, you have to be careful about, you know, standardizing everything because then you're talking about a, a machine cost that can elevate um, pretty, pretty quickly. And so when we look at things like guidance, you know, offering things like AutoTrack Universal um, versus, you know, AutoTrack Integrated, which is out of the factory, right? At offering things like AutoTrack Universal, which, which you could put on, a, on an old 1976 John Deere 4430 like I have behind me, offering those type of, uh, modular solutions where we can to to give that benefit and value to to customers who aren't all the same size um, so looking at that approach you know our starfire receiver the guidance systems we provide things where we can provide automation you know to all all colors of the fleet and and all ages of the fleet are uh, are are is something we're very um, very cognizant of and, and trying to provide that aftermarket retrofitability Brett, um, you know, kind of along the same lines, do you, do you see a market for um, the swarming of smaller machines? Um, I'm thinking, um, uh, this, you know, some of the concept vehicles many of you have, are, is swarming a viable option versus the automation of, of large machines? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for that. I do have kind of a thought process for that though. I think a lot of 
a lot of people, you know, when we did the concept tractor, it was obviously a huge tractor. It was like a 380 horsepower, large catalyst tractor. But a lot of people forget that we did that with two tractors. And we, we also had two pilot programs. One of our pilot programs being in the specialty, you know, grape wine business with one of our smallest machines. So the way that the way that we want to go about providing this technology is to leave it as flexible as possible. Um, so that the customers have the freedom of choice on how they want to deploy the technology. I mean, all of our companies, you know, we make all sizes of equipment, big, small, everywhere in between. Um, if, we, if we build the technology and our vehicle architecture is right, um, if a customer wants to, to swarm quad tracks, they can. It, it, all, it all depends on the, the type of work you're doing um, and also the, the demand for, for productivity. Um, it was kind of interesting when we did our pilot programs uh, and we had public information on this, if you want to learn more, but we did one with a very large carrot producer where they had an extreme need for productivity, but the work they were doing was, you know, ripping the soil three feet deep, which obviously requires a very big tractor. So they wanted to swarm huge tractors. Um, we've got other customers that, you know, they're doing other, other work. So the opportunity to use smaller equipment in a different way is 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 unique to to the application. So I think we're taking a very adaptable technology approach, so that depending on the segment, depending on the customer, they can they can optimize their fleet how they see fit. Um, so I think if you if you if you make some some good decisions on how you design your robotic systems and your automation systems, you can leave yourself you know, more options um, for deployment. Um, so I would say it, it remains to be seen. It's, 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 it's an area where there's obviously we're learning a lot because there's a lot of small robots out there now. Um, and I, I think there'll be, there'll be a multitude of solutions and I don't know that there's going to be one right answer. So I think it's, it, it's, an, it's a space that I obviously keep, keep in touch with and, 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 and try and stay as, as present as possible, but I think there's there's a lot of different directions it can go. Andrew, uh, Agco owns Fent, has for a little while now. Do you see that as a, a pragmatic commercialization or is it a feeder system to um, your, your bigger machines? The, I, I think, David, that goes directly in line with some of the things we've heard from, from Kent and, and Brett here, but you know, the one thing I would uh, add to the conversation right now is that the size of the machinery does not determine the professionalism of an operation. Uh, customers select the machinery based off the needs that they have. And that's why we offer a wide range of equipment. And so I think what you've seen from Agco and some of our, in some of our systems is looking at the big machines, looking at the small machines, even with our Zabra robot swarms, which are very small machines. And so um, what we have gained from those experiences are certainly an opportunity that uh, both or many of these solutions provide a value as does today. But where the real value comes in is some of these systems and how we can transfer it across different applications for customers. A uh, part of that is the ability to use one or excuse me, two or more machines together to complete one given task. That can provide a real value to customers. And for some customers that may mean uh, going smaller with machines. And for some customers it may mean uh, staying with larger machines, depending on the tasks that they need to complete. For example, uh, a large square baler has a requirement in terms of what it needs to actually complete that process. And so there, these smaller machines may not make sense. But as we talk about uh, other applications where we're looking for greater precision, more precise treatment of individual crops, especially when we're working in fields where the crop is already growing, there may be a real environment there. So I think that's uh, really how we approach it is focusing on systems that do uh, provide customer viability, but also looking to see where those individual systems can le be leveraged across our product line, whether or not an operator is seated in the cab, or we're now at the point where our operator to machine ratio is different than today, where we've reached something other than one-to-one, -one, we now have that scalability approach, which becomes a lot more viable solution. Great, so we just have a couple minutes left um, I would encourage our panelists to go ahead and answer any of the questions we might not have gotten to um, during this public discourse, but uh, perhaps you could provide some feedback um, individually to some of these questions. And I'd like to end 
um, by just giving you all the option to uh, opportunity to talk about um, what are their biggest challenges now. We've got a lot of dynamics coming into this space. Uh, we have um, regulation, um, social concerns. We have technology. We have farmer adoption. We have a, a, um, a more educated farmer. We have all these factors. What are your biggest challenges? And um, what are your biggest opportunities? Kent, I'll let you go first. Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks again. <clears throat> this was a great discussion. You know, I think... I think as we move forward, the kind of ties back to your swarm, you know, smaller fleet conversation too, but we're all trying to solve the same problem or continue to drive the same solution, which is feeding the world, right? And so your boundary diagram is pretty defined. And so meaning there's not going to be more acres. And, and so we will evolve as, as, that, as that evolves, as people's diets evolve, as, as that industry evolves. So you know, that will be both a driving force. As we look at just the, the next opportunities in automation, I, I like to bucket it in two, two areas. Really hard. It's really easy to provide value in automation of things you can't see. So think rear view camera, think grain quality camera that we have. That those are inside the machine. People inside those. As we get into the, the forward looking spaces now, the really hard one is, is automated. Essentially, you're trying to replace the human brain, you know, is what, what the cognitive load of the human brain is. You're trying to replace that. And, and it's, and the human brain is pretty powerful. So as we go forward, that, that kind of seeing and, and replacing that in job quality and productivity is, is the challenge going forward. And, um, but I look forward to the challenge. Right. I know we're out of time, but brief, we want to uh, talk about challenges and opportunities. Yeah, I actually did a, a presentation one time called the challenges and opportunities of automation. So I, I, I've got some good ones for you, but just to be brief, I think the opportunity is, is big. I, I believe that we can make equipment both easier to use and highly automated at the same time with the same technologies. So to me, delivering productivity and making things easier on the farmer is extremely important. So opportunity wise, there's a lot of potential challenge wise. It's, it's, I would, I'm confident saying it's one of the toughest problems that we've set out to solve. So there's, there's a multitude of challenges from perception, just general technology challenges, but what I'll focus on here for just a second is just the broader challenge of, of versatility. Um, one of the reasons that tractors implements and, and, and things are so successful is they're extremely versatile. Um, these tractors can do dozens and dozens of jobs, dozens of dozens of different ways, depending on where you are in the world and, and, and farmer preference, exact business. Um, so tackling and making a, a robotic or automated solution that that can be adaptable enough to, to solve problems for a, a variety of customers is, is, is quite a task. To, to meet the expectations, these things have to do extremely high quality work. They have to do work as directed by the farmer and they have to work in many different conditions. So if, if we can't do high quality work, we can't meet the customer expectation Therefore, we can't get the productive product, productivity or, or the outcome we want. So challenge perspective, I think there's just a, a very broad set of adaptability or versatility we have to consider. And then in addition to that, there's all the technology challenges. They're just hard problems to solve. But, I mean, you, you do it. I think it's going to be one of the most significant drivers of productivity you know, over the next coming years that we've seen in, in quite some time. So to me, this is really, you know, the next phase of, of, of precision ag value generation. Um, we saw it in the late 90s, early 2000s, where we really saw, you know, yield monitoring, guidance, GPS come, come to farming. I think this will be another exciting period um, to see how it lands. But that, that's how I would answer it, David. So thanks. Andrew, you have the final word. Okay, I'll see if I can do this here in 30 seconds because I think this aligns perfectly with what Agco is set to do. 
Our vision statement is uh, uh, farmer focused solutions to sustainably feed our world. And as we look at autonomy and automation, there's three things that stand out. We need to sustain, we need to feed our world. We have a growing pop population and the land size is not getting bigger. We need to be sustainable. We need to take care of that world. We need to take care of the people, the animals that are in that world and the, and the crops that we have. And the farmer focus side is we need to make our farmers more profitable. So if I were to sum up our opportunities with, with autonomy, automation, and what we strive to do, it's directly in our vision statement of farmer focused solutions to sustainably feed this world. And with that, David, I'll, I'll hand it back to you and we'll just say thank you to everybody that's uh, joined today. And thank you to, to David for, for hosting this. Yeah, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists and FIRA for hosting us and uh, making giving us the opportunity during this roundtable discussion. Uh, we are over time, but I think it was well worth it to uh, get some feedback and perspectives um, from this great panel. So my sincere thanks, and uh, thank you to all of you who joined and participated. And I will turn this back over to the FIRA uh, folks and Gwendolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So please, uh, for the attendees, you can go to the other session. There is another roundtable with just starting. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the um, for this really interesting debate, and uh, maybe talk to you at World Fira 2021. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.